Um, first off, we'll just do a general overview. So what is influencer marketing? Well, it's a form of social media marketing and it can include things, hopefully everyone can see me, like endorsements, product placements, um, and these influencers are people, organizations that have an expert level of knowledge or social influence in their field. Um, promotions with influencers can help your organization reach new audiences, build brand awareness, build trust with theirs and your target audiences, and engage with locals. Um, fit, as most of you guys probably know, it's a super important factor, both for you when you're finding an influencer and for an influencer when they're choosing who to work with. Um, our panelists here recommend doing your homework and making sure there's a good match before embarking with any influencer relationship. <clears throat> So, if you're ready to start leveraging influencers, make sure to have a plan in place that includes, obviously, budget, uh, your organization's internal and external calendars, um, whether it includes social media or events or campaigns, and also an idea of your long-term goals, because communicating clear expectations will set the stage for a successful influencer partnership. So, with that being said, I will introduce our panelists. I'm sure most of you guys know Tim. Uh, he is a conservation communicator with the Origin, Origin, Oregon, Oregon, Oregon. Um, <laughs> Department of Fish and Wildlife, where he does digital storytelling and hosts and produces the Beaver State podcast. Um, he's passionate about finding new ways to connect people to Oregon's fish and wildlife through video audio, photography, and social media, among other digital platforms. He spent a decade as a print television and radio journalist and digital manager before focusing on conservation communication. So, um, Tim, thank yes. you for joining us today. Happy to be here. <laughs> so why did you decide to start working with influencers? So, like a lot of people, I inherited the social media when I got to Oregon and, um, so there was a Facebook existing, a Twitter account existing. Um, we didn't have an Instagram set up. And so as I started uh, setting up an Instagram, looking for people to follow, I kept finding interesting people out in the state that were, you know, and, th and this was, you know, six years ago. So there were influencers already in that space. Right. Um, I didn't really call them that. They're just people that were connected to their communities. They were very visible on that platform. And I started out originally just asking them to do like Instagram takeovers. So I'm like, hey, you, yes. you know, you live in a cool place. You get to catch these really cool fish. Um, you know, would you like to take over the account for a week? And so it, it started like that. We built the relationship. I love those, yeah. And as we developed those relationships, um, I realized that I had an advantage in that, you know, I have a government account. People are not really trusting the government. But right. these guys are in their communities, people love them, they're tied into their fly fishing shops, they're tied into their local fishing communities, and I could leverage that to actually, you know, uh, bring some, gov or some agency messaging to, uh, especially when we had specific messaging to communities. Maybe there's drought conditions in uh -huh. a place, you know, and we're asking anglers to do some conservation measures. Um, when we ask on the government account, it's not well received. But if right. my friends start putting out there, yes. hey, guys, let's get together and, you know, help fish. And so I realized, like, I could, you know, leverage this around the state. Um, so years later, I applied for an RBFF grant, and um, we were able to actually build that program into something where we right. um, took that relationship to the next level. We provided them fishing rods. We, we kind of um, did a bunch of swag and, and really kind of uh, built that into, you know, what I consider kind of ambassadors slash influencers. Um, yeah. And some of them, you know, have... A lot of followers. Some of them don't have a lot of followers, right. um, but it's really just been a, a cool relationship that kind of came again out of just building an Instagram account yeah. and kind of getting introduced to these people around the state. I think one of the best ways to kind of get to know that space and who's resonating in your space is to just be like a lover and user of social media. Like yeah. that helps so much because like you're saying, like you're on social media, you see what's happening, you see what's resonating, and just being active, I think is the best way to get knowledge. Absolutely. So what tips would you have, I guess, for any state agencies looking to start utilizing influencers or just like get their feet wet and know what's out there? Yeah, I mean, the pitfalls are that you can, a lot of influencers might have, uh, you know, high followings and, and maybe they're not, uh, you know, they might be focused on, on promoting the brands they're associated uh -huh. with, you know, so there's, there's a lot of different kinds. And I tended to look for people 
you know, who I saw were really tied in to their communities. Um, I wanted to find people around the state who were regionally, um, you know, uh, regionally Active. specific, right? So you yeah. have you have our coastal anglers who focus on a lot of steelhead and salmon. Mm -hmm. You have you know our our high desert region, which is a lot more you know trout fishing, um, you know, or warm water. And so I wanted to find people in all those different spaces. You know, so I looked for. I looked for anglers that were, you know, hashtagging specific places okay. or maybe, uh, I like that. you know, and, and I use several different platforms to kind of find people around the state. So um, it doesn't have to simply be Instagram. There's, you know, nowadays there's all kinds of influencers on TikTok that focus on fishing. Yes. You know, so you have a lot of different places you can look. But I, I think the biggest thing, I looked for authenticity. I looked for people who were, you know, uh, real uh, and, and you could identify with, you know, and... You know, there, there are some dangers, obviously, you have to consider. Um, I, do, I do a quick background check and just make sure they don't have any fish and wildlife violations. Because, you know, you bring somebody start. in, they're talking, <laughs> and, uh, you know, all of a sudden you find out they haven't, you know, they've been uh, nailed for not buying a fishing license before. On your and it's most like, wanted you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so, so you, you do need to do a little bit of uh, due diligence just in, in terms of. Um, yeah, of course. And, and again, you know, so we, we would bring them in to do a takeover first which kind of helped us develop a relationship I with them. Yeah. So it, it was a little more organic in that sense. We didn't, you know, just, you know, and we don't sign contracts with folks. I mean, that, okay. that's really not what we do. We, we tend to build it more as a relationship. I, I also don't have a lot of people that I use because the problem for me is I can't have an army of people that I don't have a relationship with. I need to yeah. be able to, you know, we text back and forth. You know, we, I mean, you know, these people, I consider them friends now. Right. Um, you know, and um, they're, you know, they're people that I can plug into our agency resources. You know, they are all volunteers for us now because that allows them to ride in our, you know, state vehicles. And, you know, so we've, we've kind of crossed a lot of different barriers to, to get them more tied in with the agency. But really still, it's, it's small, you know, it's relationship-based. Yeah, um, I was about to say, I think the more they get to know you as well, the more... Um, they'll know, I guess, what's acceptable and what you will approve if you're, and then eventually it will get to a point where they don't have to say, is this okay to post? Is this okay? Yeah. Because you have that relationship and they Absolutely. know you well. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's the, the, some difficulties, like we, we had an issue this year where, um, we had a lot of national attention around, uh, wild steelhead retention in the state. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and our influencers, you know, they came down on different sides of the issue. I mean, they're, they're, I, didn't, I didn't pick people on one side of the political right. spectrum. So obviously they, have, they all have different feelings and opinions about it. I had to do a lot of work in talking to them about why the agency was making certain decisions. And then I told them, hey, we're not telling you how to, you know, post. Right. and a lot of them exactly. did. They posted on one side of the issue that maybe was not the side that the agency was on. And I think that's a thing you have to kind of respect is people can have differences, opinions, and, Yeah, you know, and um, give them that creative freedom. Yeah, and so, you know, but I can also call them up and say, hey, you know, I need some help. You know, would you mind making a video that explains this process? And some of the influencers are just more than happy to yeah. sit down and create a five-minute you know, right, and like, they can drill it down yeah. to something super simple and digestible yeah. that for you or us or professional in that space, it's like you want to give so much information, it's too much, and yeah. it doesn't hit. Exactly, so. and people in their communities love and respect them, so they, you know, they pick up that messaging, and it's not, they don't feel like it's coming from a, an account that just has a logo <laughs> up in the corner, right. you know. So. Cool. Well, thank you, Tim. Yes. Um, next, we have Snooki, who is actually a real life influencer with us. So thank you for joining. Um, before, I'm not going to give Snooki a formal introduction because I want you to kind of tell people how you got started, um, what you like about it, what makes your job easier, what makes your job harder. Just like give us the scoop. The Snooky Scoop. Okay. <laughs> Snooky Scoop. Y'all see the scoop? <laughs> um, so I started fishing when I was little, running around with a Mickey mini rod um, in my diaper at Echo Lake <laughs> with my parents. Um, Photos or didn't happen? Uh, we're not checking for that. <laughs> um, but, you know, flash forward, going through high school and you know, spending some time with my parents, that was like the thing to do with my mom and dad was yeah. to go fishing. So in 2014, my papa, who is my best friend still to this day, um, passed away. He was in hospice for two weeks, so I took off work and I moved into my grandparents' house. I was with him when he passed away, and I will tell you that if you haven't 
experienced watching someone leave this earth, it will do some things to you that you probably didn't know could be done. Um, I was raised with faith and family and friendship and all the right things. My parents did an amazing job, always making sure I had what I needed, but unfortunately, that disconnect of not having my pawpaw with me anymore just turned me into a very dark person. Um, I didn't want to be around my friends, my family. I kind of questioned my faith and saying like, why did you take him? Yeah, I was just a very unpleasant person to be around. Um, so it took a little bit of trial and error, but one day I just looked in the mirror, you know, I had mascara all over my face from crying and hated the world. And I was like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just go to the park. Let's yeah. see what this does. Um, I grabbed my rod and I went fishing and I'll be darned if I didn't like cast and it's up in the tree and I'm yanking on it. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Just like, this is not, right. like, everybody says the outdoors heals. What's going on? Yes. Why isn't it working for me? Um, so I kept trying and I kept trying and I finally caught a fish and I just remember sitting there and just crying, just letting it all out. I remember like sitting at the water and like seeing my papa's face in the casket and seeing like the trauma that wow. it did to my family and just all the emotions just came, came out. out and I was yeah. like, I, this is not what he wants for me. He does not want me to be this kind of person. Right. He didn't work all those years, you know, snapping green beams and talking about everything that he had been through and just hanging out with Papa and, and might I say that I never saw my grandfather in jeans. He was always in church pants and always in church shoes. Always wow. just like a very good person. <laughs> I never saw him smoke. I never saw him drink. Not to say that people that do are bad, but just, <laughs> he was just very old school and like mm -hmm. he instilled certain things in me that I'm so glad that I hold on to today in this world that we live in. Um, so on his one year death anniversary, I was like, I remember when I went through you know, sitting at Echo Lake, I don't mm -hmm. want to do that again. So right. I, I did some Google searching and I found the Virginia Bass League, which was an online tournament trail at the time. Yeah. Um, and I remember like looking through the website and looking on Facebook and trying to find like, who runs this thing? Like, I need to talk to this person. And it was Eric. And at the time, Eric didn't know who I was. I didn't know him. And I called him and I said, hey, this is my story. Yeah. Help me. And he's like, well, you're not a tournament angler. Have you ever fished a tournament? I'm like, no. I have this little tackle box. Like, I am by no means prepared for this. Um, but at least you're not using the Mickey and Minnie rod still. <laughs> yeah. so I had upgraded. We have a little bit of a <laughs> change there. Yeah, so we, uh, we got everything together. And I told him, I said, I need someone who's going to teach me fishing. I don't, and I know this can be taken a couple ways, but... I don't want a guy that's going to flirt with me the whole time. Mm -hmm. I don't want a guy on the boat that's going to not allow me to cry if I need to let it out at that moment. I understand it's a tournament. It's not, um, like, all about myself. But I just, I just want to be on the water and fishing. And feeling safe. Yeah. Doing it, yeah. Very much so. Safe on different, um, different yeah. views. But we finally, after, like, three or four people, he would send me, like, a bio or a Facebook link. And I'm like, I don't think that's a good fit. Huh. I don't think this is one. And I was like starting to question it. And then he sent me Bruce Callis. Bruce Callis has now been my best friend for That's awesome. ever. Like he and I can talk about anything. We fish together. We laugh together. We go to boating shows together. And he has taught me so much about fishing. Um, so I really have him to thank for that. And since then, I have, you know, volunteered my time for tournaments. I've worked with kids with disabilities mm -hmm. and taking them fishing and it's just like trickled down from there just putting my feet in any little puddle of fishing that I possibly could. And it goes to show the importance of mentors as well. Very much so. Um, in one's own fishing journey. So um, I guess what do the people that you work with, partners, whether it be us because we work together very closely, um, what do you wish they knew about a day in the life of an influencer? in terms of like creating content or what you look for when you're at a boat show or when you're filming yourself fishing? Like what kind of things resonate with you and what makes your job easier and harder when you're doing those? Yeah, so I think um, I had written down like a bunch of ideas. I could talk about this forever because it's super important. But I think that looking for categorizing the two, um, when we're talking about making my job harder, I think safety is one. As an influencer, we are 
expected to post prior to an event, um, right. which lets like people know, hey, I'm not going to be home. My home's empty. True. Um, yeah. Hey, if you have something you know, that you want to say to me or if you have any kind of issues, then my safety's on the line because you know right. where I'm staying, you know what show I'm going to be at, you know where How my seminars are. How long you're going to be gone. Yeah. Exactly. So that safety aspect, I think a lot of people don't think about and it's not talked about a lot. Yeah, um, that's a good point. I actually didn't even think about it till you just said it right now because there is a lot of vulnerability when you're putting yourself out there and it's not just your business, right? It's like not just your professional face. Like it's your whole self. Yep, it's yeah. my family too. Right. It's like everybody involved. Um, so I would say that safety was one of them for making my job harder. Um, I think too, and this is something that I'm glad that I'm a part of this workshop and seeing what everyone has been working on is that generation gap. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm 33 and I'm just now learning how to do TikTok. I have a six year old that's teaching me how to do TikTok. So <laughs> I feel the pain of like how things are changing and how social media is always, you know, a new trend's coming out. It never sleeps, it's always moving. So yeah. I think finding a way to bridge that generation gap, like trying to not just create the content and be an influencer for my clients, but also educate them, like tell them right. what's new, tell right. them how to do something, show them, let them get that hands-on experience so that if for any reason the relationship breaks off, they've gained something extra out of it. It's just that going that extra step to be there for those people, um, I think is been kind of a challenge, but I've seen so much grace come out of it and so many new amazing opportunities. Yeah. I'm glad that you said your six-year-old helps you with TikTok. Because my almost 11-year-old, I'll use him to test transitions and things like that. So glad to know I'm not alone. Um, so last but certainly not least, by any stretch of the imagination, is Sarah Friedley from Exponent. And she is kind of our agency eyes. Um, so she works a lot with influencers, and not just in our own outdoor space, but in many different spaces with her clients. So um, as an account supervisor at Exponent, she provides strategic guidance and acts as a partner with her clients. Um, like many PR professionals, she can be a jack of all trades at times, which I feel like working in social space, <laughs> regardless, you kind of have yes. to be. Um, but I know your particular passion lies with influencer marketing. Um, so she has seven years of PR, social media, and influencer marketing experience. Um, and she's worked with clients, and hopefully this is still correct, like Coca-Cola, Jack Links, the California Strawberry Commission, Jackson Hole Travel and Tourism, and of course, RBFF. So, um, I was gonna say, when you're not at work, you like taking pictures of your golden doodle and sure enjoying do. the many lakes in Minnesota. So, um, since you've been in working in this space for a long time, kind of at this agency level across different verticals, how has it changed from when you first started working with influencers to what you're seeing now? And even maybe if you wanna to touch upon like what you think the future might look yeah. like of working with influencers. Yeah, so it's gotten way more sophisticated yes. <laughs> since when I first started working working on it. Um, I would say when I first started working with influencers, it was kind of seen almost more as a media buy. Right. It wasn't really a partnership. Mm -hmm. um, and when I first started working with influencers, it was still like mommy blogger galore. Right. Um, lots of giveaways, lots of unpaid partnerships, lots of things like that. Um, fast forward to now, and we really try to make it a partnership with everybody that we work with. Um, we try to make it so that the content on their channels is really authentic to them, authentic to the brand, yeah. um, and not more transactional like a media buy as it used to be. Um, in the future, I see that only <laughs> becoming stronger um, and only more opportunities coming up with partnerships like that. Yeah. Um, and especially with longer term influencer partnerships, I think there's such an untapped opportunity there with a lot of partnerships. Um, and I see that that being one of the biggest things going forward with influencers. I feel like it almost started out with mommy bloggers. Like yes. I feel like that was kind of like the earliest way that influencers were being used. Because I sure. remember hearing about it like 10 or 15 years ago. And that was like what I always heard when I yes, was exactly. hearing about influencers was these mommy bloggers, mommy influencers. And, um, and I guess also travel too. Like it seemed to skew those. But 
what's interesting is that I think that you guys have all touched upon like authenticity is key. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's on your perspective, like looking someone to share this official government message, you being you and having to be your true authentic self. And when you're looking for partnerships for your clients, like making sure that authenticity comes across in the partnership. So um, very cool. So I guess we kind of touched upon it too, but um, how are we doing on time? Is this going up or going down? No. Down, okay. Um, what <laughs> successes have you guys seen? And we'll do kind of um, each of you at a time, but what successes have you seen? Um, doesn't have to be like heavy data ROI, but in terms of even just like your brand authority, like what successes have you seen from your influencer partnerships or campaigns? Yeah, I think for us, you know, some of the, the best success really has been um, dealing with issues that come up and being able to rely on the, the, you know, people in that space, the influencers, our ambassadors to message back to the community. Um, you know, communicating science is, is tough. Yeah. There's a lot of context to it. Social media does, isn't often, there's not enough space, there's not enough, you know, uh, characters to, to really communicate literally well. characters yeah, and uh, you know so the so the challenge is often you know taking a really complex maybe it's a change in the regulations or you know we're, we're cutting a season or something like that um, and so I can rely on those influencers by by basically you know I call them up we talk you know I, I put them together with one of our biologists they go to a hatchery or they, they go to a meeting mm -hmm. they learn about the issue and then they are sort of my voice back to the community and so we've dealt with a couple of situations, you know, one being uh, drought conditions that were impacting a certain area, one of our most popular fisheries. And I leaned heavily on a couple of our influencers that live in the community, are tied in closely. They're, they're you know, fly anglers. They're very um, influential even beyond social media. Just yeah. they're, they're trusted. And, and mm -hmm. you know, so I found that that for me is, is great because it takes uh, the pressure off me to try to, to, to utilize our social media when I know that there's just gonna be a lot of toxicity there. You know, for them, they're already in that community, they're tied in, and so those, those have been really the biggest ones for me. Um, you know, I think others in our communications department might see some, some other value beyond that, just in terms of, you know, um, campaigns and, you know, communicating things that are maybe not, you know, as serious. I look at the, the, the PR stuff and think about how am I gonna deal with this really complex issue. Yeah. And I get, to, I get to rely on them for that. But, you know, they've helped us do a lot of fun stuff, you know, free fishing weekends, things like that too, yeah. so, so that's And cool. I know one thing we talked about too yesterday, which was interesting, and I wanted to bring up here, was um, making sure that when the influencers are out there capturing content, like fishing or hunting or any sort of outdoor space, like making sure they're doing it responsibly, yeah. because if they're not, um, sure, it looks bad on them, but it really looks bad for you, if, especially if they're creating content for your channels. Yeah, there's a conversation going on around the conservation world about, you know, um, it, this is specific to Oregon, but you know, we we recommend people keep fish in the water, you know, to take photos and stuff like that. It's we talk a lot about mortality, increased mortality because of you know people want to take pictures, and so I asked an influencer recently, you know. Because you may only catch one of these unicorn fish, the, these steelhead, the right. winter steelhead in Oregon, once a year, you know, do you spend more time with that fish because you need photos of it for, you know, your role as an influencer? Sure. She said, yeah, you know, I do. And, you know, so I just, I said, you know, multiply that by thousands of influencers. Right. You know, I go, nobody can put a number on We don't know if no, that's increased no. mortality or not. But it, it made me think. Yeah, and it made her think, too. And she started thinking, well, you know what, I should, I should really consider, reconsider how I you know, how I do that. And so, though she can fly to Florida and get thousands of pictures very quickly because she spends a lot of her time fishing there. But, we, but in Oregon, she may only catch that one fish and that, you know, it's a big deal to her. She's got to document it because a lot of her work relates to that, so. And I think too, one thing that comes up from these conversations is an opportunity to create more content. I mean, right? Like yeah. now it gives you the opportunity not just to um, raise the profile of your agency and also encourage people to go fishing or boating or what have you, but it also now you're like, okay, well maybe we should do a conservation message yeah. and start like doing some series around that. So um, thank you for sharing that with us. So Snooki, I'm going to ask you the same questions. What successes, and again, it can either be like anecdotal or like follower growth. What successes have you seen from any partnerships or campaigns that you've worked on? And you can use us as an example if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that 
Personal growth would be one that I would like to highlight. Um, networking is always top priority because you don't know when you create that handshake and you introduce yourself to someone what that is going to lead for the future. Um, so just talking about like collaborating with the women making waves, like talking with those women, I have learned that my problems, I don't have to hold them you know, inside anymore. Like when it comes to yeah. being an influencer, having social anxiety, um, often, you know, not feeling like I have enough time to recharge and understanding that even though I'm an introvert, I can still do extroverted things. Yeah. <laughs> um, and having those women to support those, those conversations um, of things that I'm personally going through and hearing their stories and learning how to be empathetic to that has been so empowering. Um, it has changed me as a person and it's changed the way that I, uh, interact with people as well. So I think that that would be something very important to highlight. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to the introverts that are here yeah. today or have been <laughs> up on this stage. Um, Sarah, same with you. What successes have you seen from, I guess, your clients' influencer mm -hmm. um, campaigns or partnerships? Yeah. Um, influencers just make the brand way more relatable. Um, and influencers, people kind of look at them like they're friends and they really trust right. what they say. Yeah. Um, and if an influencer that they really respect and trust is doing something, they're more likely to try it. Um, and it makes me think of Women Making Waves also because we're doing a lot with that campaign and that initiative um, to work with women like Snooki um, and the women that she was mentioning and then also some women who are new to the sport mm -hmm. um, to make it seem like the person who's in their community or someone that follows them, it's easier for them to try fishing and boating. Um, or they can look at that content and get some ideas for how they can get started. Um, so I think really making those partnerships that make your brand more relatable and more actionable um, is what the best successes I've seen are and always will be. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So we're going to get a little uncomfortable, and I'm going to ask, has there been any, have you guys seen or gotten any negative backlash from working with influencers? Um, and if so, do you have any recommendations on how to mitigate those issues or handle them? Like, unfortunately, or fortunately, right, because you get uncomfortable and that allows you to grow, but unfortunately there is going to be negativity from time to time, right? Everyone who works in PR is, has a crisis communications plan. COVID, where are you at? Um, so, Tim, can you walk us through, have you experienced any of those? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's certainly drawbacks that, you know, and challenges. Uh, you know, the a lot of times I've used influencers more as an in-between, mm -hmm. so I don't have to use our social media as mm -hmm. much when it comes to, commu again, communicating complex things or uh, reaching out to a community that, you know, maybe we're not very popular in. Um, and so, you know, with that can come the, the, the loss of credibility for them in, in those spaces. Sure. And they, they worry about that and they express that to me. And, you know, I mean, sometimes it means reformatting the messaging or, you know, saying, hey, you know, come at it your own way, right? And, um, you know, we have to talk through those issues because they don't want to lose credibility yeah, in the community. And, you know, they also have the right to question us. Maybe they don't think that what we're doing is very popular. And so I, I do get backlash from the influencers that I work with, um, which is great because they, they question us. That it makes me come back mm -hmm. with better answers, right. you know, better information for them, and, you know, which I think makes it more solid. And then some just say, you know what, I'm not going to touch that issue. Mm -hmm. Just... <laughs> I'm yeah. not going to do it, Fair. you know, and again, we don't, we don't pay our influencers. So, you know, it's, it's definitely built on relationships, um, you know, and, the, and then there are, I, I had, I talked to one that we, um, have been working with for a couple of years. She told me the other issues. I had to get off social media. I just, it's killing me. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And she goes, <laughs> but I, but I have been taking people fishing. And I'm like, I, that's, that's all I can ask. Like, you know, yeah. that the influence doesn't necessarily have to come from, the social media space, it can come from, you know, the relationships they have in the community, teaching people, mentoring, you know, she's like, I'm, I'm taking people fishing, but I, I can't be on social media right now. I'm like, yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> get fair. off of it. So. Yeah, I feel like anyone who works in social media or any <laughs> user of social media, right, will sometimes yeah. be like, I just need a break. Mm -hmm. um, what about you, Snooky? Have you experienced any, like, negative or uncomfortable situations? Obviously, putting yourself out there naturally results in uncomfortable situations, but... Um, what's kind of your way that you navigate those? Um, I think something that people don't think about is when you are in the general public and you're an influencer, and whether it be fishing or cooking or whatever yeah. your passion is, um, 
you have to have a face, and you have to have an authentic face to get anywhere in this world. But yeah. I think like always having to be put on and, and having everybody in this room has an opinion, mm -hmm. you know, and if everyone put a comment on this video, like section. how do I manage those yeah. opinions? Like how do I know which ones, uh, which ones of the feedback are actually worth investigating and like trying to maybe use that for my own growth and which ones are just like people just being like, hey, the trolls. there's nothing yeah. I can do. You put me under a, a microscope, there you're gonna find imperfections. Mm -hmm. um, and right. I think that coming into the influencer world when I first started, the first two and a half years was just like really rough with that. And, and trying to find support and understanding of how to manage that, um, I think would be what I would yeah, say for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. A comment section, man. You yeah. have to be in like a mentally healthy place to read some of those, mm -hmm. especially on Twitter. Um, Sarah, what about you? Have any of your clients experienced some negative or uncomfortable situations with influencers or even, I mean, something I know Tim and I talked about is like, what if you align yourself with an influencer and like something comes up that yeah. was shady in their past? Like, how do you manage that as a client? Like cut off ties, right. things like that. Right. Uh, that's a good question. I haven't actually dealt, luckily, knock on yeah. wood, with any <laughs> crisis situations with influencers. Um, but I think that's because we are really diligent with how we vet influencers before we partner with them. Um, and especially with RBFF, there's so many good relationships that are already existing um, that we've leveraged. And then with new influencer partnerships, like we'll go back on all their social channels at least a year, see what they've okay. been talking about. Um, we'll Google search them with yeah. a bunch of different keywords. As weird and creepy as that sounds, it just helps you know who these people really are um, and if they've been quoted in the media or if they've been talked about in their communities or anything like that. Um, and if there are any red flags, we bring those up to clients to before we're partnering with anybody so that we can kind of avoid that. Yeah. Um, but then if anything were to come up in a partnership, we do put contracts into place for most of our right. um, partnerships. So we have the ability, if there's anything that goes against what our BFF would stand for, or any of my other clients stand for, that contract allows us to get out of that partnership if needed. Um, we try to avoid that wherever possible, but that's a little bit of security that we have in place. Yeah, that's good. Google can either be your best friend or your worst yeah, enemy, I Yeah, exactly. Um, how much time we have? We have about 24 minutes. One thing that I wanted to touch on quickly um, is I know you've heard us say various terms out here, influencers, content creation, and I just wanted to um, define that a little bit in the sense that an influencer is someone who has um, their channels built up, they have that following, they have that authority, um, they have that group of people that's aligned with them and looks at their channels and resonates with their content. But on the flip side of that is a content creator. Mm -hmm. And I guess all, all influencers are, are content creators, but not all content creators are influencers. So um, I can speak for RBFF, oh, hello, and Take Me Fishing in the sense that we will work with content creators to develop TikToks or Reels or videos or pieces of content for us in Instagram. Takeover would be a type of content creation. Um, but then we'll also work with influencers through Sarah and Exponent about people that then share, I guess, the Take Me Fishing story or share our resources with their audience. So content creation would be utilizing someone to create content for your channels. Influencers would be utilizing an influencer's channels to share your content. So. Um, for those that aren't familiar, hopefully that provides a bit of context um, there. But um, is there anything else you guys want to touch on before we open for questions? I'm sure, we'll get a lot of stuff in the Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess we'll go ahead and open up for questions, whether it be virtually or in person. So we love questions. Holler at us. We got one over here. Thank you. Um, I'm, thanks. Janice Johnson, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Um, we've used a social influencer for hunting, and it was a couple, and they were foodies from Dallas, mm -hmm. and we were kind of taking the locavore angle. And we paid them $17,000, and then we paid our ad agency to manage them. Mm -hmm. But I guess um, just wanting to know more about 
how they should or could be paid. Mm -hmm. uh, we kind of just got in a jam and had to do it. But I uh, just interested in, and I like Tim's idea about not paying, but building, relation <laughs> but building relationships. I mean, you know, I'm like, yeah, because I kind of felt that part of our posts from our social influencers, yeah, they weren't really mm -hmm. authentic. You know, they were kind of trying to please us. So just yeah. any, anybody else's experience up on the, the panel or anywhere about paying for social influencers? What's I can, it based on? Yeah, I can speak a little bit for us. Um, I mentioned a little bit about the content creation versus influencer, and maybe Sarah, you can touch on the influencer part, but for content creation, so the influencers will create content for us to share on our channels. Um, I will do it based, and Joanna, who you'll hear from next, we work together closely because we'll kind of um, work with them individually. Like Tim mentioned, it's very important to have that individual relationship with them and see kind of, and we'll do our background like Sarah, so we're <laughs> touching on everything, but we'll kind of see what their strong suits are and where they kind of shine. So maybe one is better with photos or text-based content, and we'll work on that, which is obviously gonna be less expensive than a video. And I'm a huge fan of creating efficiencies. So if they are doing a video for Instagram, can that be utilized for TikTok as well? So if you're doing that, right, you can get, I guess, more for less because it's still the same piece of content, but you're just leveraging it across different platforms. Um, so I'll let you guys speak a little bit too about you work, well, you don't pay, so. We, we, have, <laughs> we have done paid campaigns. Okay. So, so we had a long-term contract with two influencers, um, both from the TV world, so different. They're not, I mean, and they have built up social platforms, but they're, One's relatable to kind of maybe an older television hunting, you know, world. And one is okay. a fishing guide um, who uh, has a TV show as well, you know. And so we, we paid them actually a very strict focus on live streaming. They, they were paid to do live streams with us uh, throughout the seasons covering a lot of different things. Okay. Um, I, I ended that in the pandemic because um, it was just challenging. We, we had so many cancellations and stuff. Right. Um, and I, I've noticed that, you know, live streaming has you know, kind of, it's one of those things that's fallen, fallen away a little bit, I think. Mm -hmm. um, we're not relying on nearly as much. We, we have found some other better ways to communicate, you know, things, you know, about the regulations or even teaching, you know, um, we're back to live workshops and whatnot. So, um, but we have done a couple of paid campaigns. But I, I find that, like, the relationship aspect for us is, is a good way to do it. And I'm, I'm exploring other ways mm -hmm. to, to work with content creators, especially. Yeah. Um, you know, it, that may end up coming down to paying people again in the future. So I think, I think you can kind of go back and forth between both. Our ambassadors are a little more, they all have social media profiles. Some of them are built up and, and I would consider them more influencers. And some are just, they're influential in their communities. So we, we have kind of a, a, a little different approach than you're kind of straight up, everybody has a high Instagram following. Yeah. Yeah. And what about you, Sarah? How do you manage payments or working through contracts? For sure. So with contracts, we, we have just one set contract that's kind of like a template, and then it just yep. depends on what the deliverables are and all of that good stuff. Um, with payment, don't be afraid to negotiate. Um, and I would say if you're working with a few influencers with the same sort of size and content type, um, that's kind of how you can base what the payment is. So if someone's getting paid X amount and someone's asking for something that's way higher than that, um, don't be afraid to negotiate down a little bit to where that other similar influencer's at. Um, and along with that, I'm gonna echo what you two said about the types of content too. Like, it's gonna depend on what type of content you're asking for and how much content and how much posting and all of that. So those are a few things to keep in mind for sure. And I'll say too, like I also, um, like Joanna and I both kind of like starting with something, we call it like a test or yes. just to kind of see like, is this going to work? Is this going to resonate? Is this a good partnership before we spend yes. a larger amount of money? So yeah, hopefully that small. answers your, your question. Good. Yes. All right. Glenn. Hi. Hi. Hello, uh, Glenn Hughes with the American Sport Fishing Association. There are a lot of politics in fishing, and there's a lot of folks that think they know what's right, and uh, a lot of different groups influence others in that regard. And so I'm wondering from a combination of, of the three of you, one, how do you educate yourself on, on the information out there and, and, and know who maybe has the correct answers and, and 
share that information or do you try to avoid the politics and focus just on, on really the participation or engagement with fishing? I will tell you, I always try and avoid politics personally and professionally. <laughs> um, but I'll start with Tim since I know you kind of yeah. dabbled on that in the beginning. Well, so yeah, politics of fishing is, yeah, <laughs> somebody should write a book on that. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's challenging because, um, again, I tried to select people from all different types of backgrounds um, and, and people that reflected their communities. So obviously some of our communities are more rural, um, you know, and, and those folks, you know, it, it, this is big. This has been a, a challenge too. Some of our, our influencers, our ambassadors, they absolutely love us. They'll say anything we want, you know, which, which can be good, but I also want them to have their own, you know, uh, opinions and whatnot. And some challenge us on, on, on everything. In terms of misinformation, I'm, I'm a real stickler for that. And so, you know, I, I, I see their social media all the time. And if I see something that is, you know, they're, they're parroting something they're hearing out there that is absolutely wrong, I will call them out on it. I mean, I usually do it personally. I don't go in their social media and call them out. But I will say, hey, guys, that is not accurate. That is not what the agency is doing. Or, you know, that's, that's not, you know, there's a lot of com combative stuff between fly anglers and, and bass anglers in our state uh, or, you know, how people use the water. There's a lot of conflict between uh, guides and, and bank anglers, things like that. And so, and we just live in a world where misinformation is all over the place. So, uh, so I, I will do it, but more from a relationship standpoint. Um, and a lot of times what I'll do is, I, I, it won't come from me. I will say, hey, let's get you back in touch with your district biologist and let's you know, let's figure out where, where's this, where's this coming from? And so I try to plug them back into people who can really walk them through or give them an experience. We've been doing a lot of like bringing them into the agency for our, you know, spawning programs or, or, you know, really again, plugging them in hands in, hands on with, with a lot of the stuff we do. So, um, I, I, I would love to avoid it more, but sometimes you can't. It's so yeah. in that case, I just try to re lean on the relationship that we have with them. And I think what's cool about that, which we kind of talked about earlier, is that, right, like sometimes when something like that happens, like it does give you the opportunity to create more content yeah. and course correct. Um, so yeah, it's uncomfortable, but yeah, it's also inevitable. And maybe there's an opportunity that comes out of that, that can be a win for both you or your client or the influencer. Um, do you, you had another question, right? It was like a twofer. So from the point of view, yeah. how do you decide, you know, how do you get educated on the information out there? Share Got it. Share? Yeah, so um, I don't like conflict. Um, how I, she like navigates learning new things or making sure that what she's sharing and capturing is accurate and correct and I guess responsible as well. Yeah, so um, I try to avoid the politics from a like really posting on social media and like getting involved in like arguments and things like that. Um, just because I find that a lot of times it can go either way and is it worth me destroying everything that I've worked so hard to build. Um, but on the flip side also, if it's something that I believe in and people are being mistreated or things are being said that aren't appropriate, I will step up and say, hey, like, hey, we need to address this. But I, like you said, don't go and, you know, argue on right. social media. Um, we had a big issue with, like, snakeheads and people saying, well, snakeheads are killing the bass population. So I just did what you said and I went out with my local biologist and I started educating myself on like w what is really happening. Like show me the science behind what people are saying. That way when I do argue it, I'm arguing with facts. I'm not arguing with opinion. Right. So. Um, and I was going to also say too, I think it kind of touches on where your story started with a mentor, right? And making sure... Um, whether it's a technique or what you're doing is the correct way to do it because you learn from someone who's experienced Very much. and knows what they're doing. So I think it's important to have that person in your network and then that kind of touches on about like going to shows and being out there and expanding your network because you never know um, where it will end up. So does that, okay, Glenn's happy. <laughs> Glenn's happy, I'm happy. Yes, of course. 
We actually have a lot of virtual questions, oh. so just uh -oh. a reminder <laughs> that if your question's not answered, you can connect with the panelists on the app. Um, but Nicole McSweeney, I believe from Massachusetts, mm -hmm. has asked, do you ever get approached by influencers that aren't a good fit for representing your agency on social, but might be important partners for another reason? How do you handle those requests without damaging the overall relationship? Yeah, I can start with that. We we do get requests, and I guess for me, it's I never like to say n no. I mean, I will say no, but I like to kind of frame it as not right now or something, because who knows like how that person will develop? Who knows how your organization will develop? Um, I always I would prefer for it to be like a, yes, and now is not the right fit or something like that. So. Um, again, like always keep people in your network, just you never know where that path or your path will go. Um, that's how I would approach it, but like feel free to chime in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, that's, a, that's a challenging one because I, I, I tend to look for authentic, authenticity <clears throat> and a lot of times I'll have people that, that are just, their, their profile is just, you know, a whole bunch of sponsors or, or they're, right. they're sponsored by some brands. Um, and I think they're looking for a little prestige in putting, you know, our the Myo DFW, you know, in their profile as well. And so, um, but a lot of times I'll just basically say, hey, you know, if if you know if you're producing really cool stuff, I'm happy to, you know, yeah, share that. Um, but because we don't pay, we don't get a lot of like requests, you know, which, <laughs> which is good. Um, but I do get I do get people who kind of want to come in and be like, you know, hey, I you know I'd love to work with you guys in a you know, hey, can you share my stuff? Lots of lots of that type of requests, and Good. and I and I do. I you know I don't have a problem sharing it, but I I certainly may not use uh, somebody in more of a like capacity. a formal yeah, partnership. Formal partnership yeah. right? mm -hmm. I will say, from an agency perspective, <clears throat> um, if someone approaches us, we always look at what their audience is that they're reaching. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's not an audience that you're looking to reach, maybe they could be a spokesperson or somebody that you use for media interviews or something like that. Um, working with an influencer doesn't always necessarily have to be on their social channels. It can be in different ways too. That's a good point. So it's kind of the same yeah. with not right now, but it could be a different type of partnership too. And I think from the influencer side, like something that I started years ago was making what I call an angler bank. And it's just a list of women and gentlemen and like mm -hmm. people I've met along the way that um, I almost like put my stamp on because they align with the same morals and values of what I'm looking for, mm -hmm. but they might be in a different area or my schedule might be of conflict. So I like to kind of use like the kitchen door, like you know how in a chef, like the door is usually revolving. Yeah. Because if I suggest, well, hey, I'm busy at this time, I can't do this boat show, but I've got a girlfriend of mine who's available, mm -hmm. that yeah. relationship cool. really does build, not just for the client, because the client sees that I genuinely care about their need, but it also shows that the other girls, like I'm giving opportunities yeah. and continuing to spread that awareness of like, it's not just Snooky out there. Right. There's so many other amazing anglers that have skills that I might not necessarily not have, or have more experience mm -hmm. doing something. And I'll tell you, like that strengthens the partnership side mm -hmm. too, because now are you not just a content creator or an influencer for us, right? You're a resource. Yeah. And if we do need something specific, hey, like Snooki has her angler rank or whatever, and we can reach out to her and see who might be a good fit. So I think that's kind of a win-win situation. Yeah. Oh. Morning. I can't really Morning. see you guys, Hi. but I'm over here. Uh, Chelsea from Maine Inland Fish and Wildlife, and I have a question. So we've talked a lot about influencers that are already out there, but mm -hmm. what experience or advice do you have for agencies who are looking to build an influencer from within? So we mm -hmm. have a couple of really great fisheries biologists that we use as our like poster child, mm -hmm. and then myself as the education and outreach. So we already have that face with the community and building that relationship. So how would you go about starting from scratch and so I'd love to hear from Snooki your side of it from the influencer and then also from the agency side of it. Oh, I'm just going to ask a quick follow-up. Are you talking about having them I guess be on your channels or their own personal channels and sharing your content? Both. Both, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, so I think if you're trying to create a character ideally, um, and trying to build that relationship. They already have the knowledge, which is great, because you don't have to teach anything. Yeah. 
um, from that perspective, but you need to learn, like, I guess, how to make them um, relatable, fun, make it kind of... Authentic. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, I it's know. weird. I'm in this position. Right. <laughs> really, like, explain it. It's more one of those, let me show you. Let me, you know, bring you on with me and, mm -hmm. and kind of show you what I do. But I think that, honestly, if you are relatable and authentic in talking about the things and adding that little bit of creative aspect of it, um, and bloopers. Everybody loves bloopers. So don't be afraid to just kind of be goofy with it yeah. and have fun because that is going to really give people a way to say, hey, this this is a real person. You know, because the term biologist is like, whoa. You yeah. know? But if you have someone who is um, making jokes and making fun with it and just being involved in the community and going out to events and, you know, just like taking photos of people and just being fun, then I think that that will grow. Yeah. over time and the audience will really appreciate that. And I think being entertaining is key, like is. to piggyback off that. Cause yeah, I mean, a bio, like biology, biologists, science stuff, like that can be totally intimidating. So if you make it approachable, accessible, entertaining, I, everyone at RBFF is probably sick of me saying the word infotainment, but if you make it informative and entertaining, it's a win-win at, plus authentic and all those other things. Yeah, so, and I think it sticks in the memory, too. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I think in TikTok audio <laughs> now, so does that help? Okay, perfect. Yay, hi, I saw you raise your hand in the beginning, so. Um, hey, this is Eric from Maryland. Two quick questions. First off, I wanna say, Tim, you're really brave. I don't <laughs> understand how you can let go of messaging, particularly when messaging's pretty, we like to keep it under control. So if you can explain to me how you have the, uh, how you can do that, that would be awesome. <laughs> and uh, second question is, is can you walk me through the line between an influencer and a local celebrity? What's the mm -hmm. difference and what are the pros and cons of reaching out to a local celebrity, maybe a football player or a baseball player or something like that? and an influencer, because we're kind of mm -hmm. working on that and we don't know where to go with it, so thank you. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, from the messaging perspective, I can see why you might be nervous about that, especially as a PR person. We like to control those messages. Um, so what we like to do when we have influencer partners, we actually have what we call a creator brief for them. Um, it's just a short document that includes all of the key messages that we would want them to include in their content, in like any voiceover that they're including in videos, whatever it ends up being. Um, so they already have all the key messages that you would want them to share. Um, but then beyond that, we include in the contracts that we have that they need to share their content with us for review before it goes live. Um, so that's a way that we can help control those messages. I will say if you do that, try to not edit the content too much because you still want it to be in the influencer's voice and you still want it to be authentic. Um, but that way you can make sure that those messages are in there. Um, and then I do have a thought on the other local celebrity versus influencer too. Just go back to what your goals are. Um, if it makes sense to work with somebody who's a baseball player in the community um, and they fish and they boat or they do anything else that you would want to be talking about, it might work. But if there's somebody that's just simply a baseball player that doesn't do all those things, it might not work. So it depends on the situation, I think. Yeah, and I feel like I'm gonna use my line again, which is kind <laughs> of like, all local celebrities are influencers in the sense they have this like audience already, but not all influencers like in the digital space or metaverse will necessarily be local celebrities, right? Because they kind of live in this online world as opposed to the real world, which is getting increasingly blurred every day. But yeah. Tim, go ahead as well. Well, I just on the, on the celebrity thing, we're working with a, a local football player who is a, a superstar football player in our state. He got into fishing actually in college while he was playing college football. And, um, you know, he's, he's become an influencer in that world. And so we've actually, we've actually worked with him and it's great because he has obviously statewide appeal. Everybody knows him. And so, um, it, it's a little different relationship. Um, you know, we, we treat it a little differently. We will have him on the podcast kind of repeatedly rather than constantly focus or, you know, but we, we, we reshare a lot of his content in social media. Uh, to the other point, um, yeah, I mean, so I, I don't go, I go out to our influencers with messaging 
And sometimes it's really complex, and I have to kind of bat it around with them first to kind of see if they get it, they kind of understand it, because um, I certainly don't want them going out with the wrong message. Um, but I think it all comes down to the relationship. I, I spend a lot of time talking to them. I, whatever, anytime I travel through their town, we get together for dinner, you know, so it's, there's just a lot of relationship there. They know they can come to me first. They, they can come to me for clarification. They can go to their local district biologist for clarification. Uh, so I feel pretty comfortable in that sense. Some of the newest people we've been working with, you know, I, it's, it's one of those things where I just, maybe I won't talk to them quite as much because I don't really know how they're going to respond to something, you know, so um, it, it really just comes down to relationship management. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, I was going to say, well, could I just really quick? I just want to say something very quick and then back to the questions because it relates to this subject. I'm Stephanie Vadalero, RBFF, and I'm sitting here. I've been working in PR, communications, and marketing for a long time, and I'm aging myself saying this. But um, the, the idea of an influencer is really a kind of spokesperson 2.0, right? But I feel like it's more accessible and more authentic. Um, it, certainly there's still a role for that celebrity, particularly when you're trying to get national media attention and build awareness around something. But um, for those in the audience who might be like, what the heck is an influencer? It's really a spokesperson on a more micro level. So thanks for asking that question. And that's it. Uh, great. And this is kind of, we've had a few questions about this. Um, do you have any ideas of how states can find local influencers? And is there a minimum number of followers? And then once you find them, how do you establish those relationships uh, and, and deal with the liabilities in managing those relationships long term? So um, I'll just start briefly with kind of a broad brush. But there are different levels of influencers. And we laugh at the different names, like neo-influencers, micro-influencers. Um, but I'll go ahead and pass it to you to kind of do the formal sure. overview of the landscape there. there like she was saying, yeah. there's just there's names for everything. Yeah. Um, I would say don't focus necessarily on the level of followers oh, that somebody yeah. has. Yeah. I think it's more important what they're talking about, the type of content that they're posting, Their if that's engagement. the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Engagement is huge, mm -hmm. um, and if it's authentic, really, or authentic engagements too. Right. Um, if you're looking at their, even their comment section, like we were saying, comment sections get crazy. <laughs> um, you can tell a lot by an influencer and how authentic they are, and if they're real, and if they're actually engaging with their audience by those comment sections. Um, so pay attention more to that sort of thing yeah. than the size of the audience. Of and what was the first part of the question? before going into like different levels of uh, Do you have any tips for state agencies to find, find and identify local influencers? I'm going to give that yeah. away, Tim. So I, you know, I, I found a lot of influencers by starting an Instagram for our state six years ago. Mm -hmm. in, in building it, I started following people. You know, I looked for hashtags that were related to our state. I looked for, I looked in communities, you know. So I, if I saw one person, I looked at their followers, and I looked who they followed, and yes. I just kind of went down the pathways and, and built it out that way. And then, you know, the, the, the key parts really are, I looked at the comments to see how did they respond in the comments. Are they kind? Are they mm -hmm. compassionate? You know, I was looking for people who, you know, didn't just post stuff and looked for a reaction. I wanted people who uh, were engaging with people about, you know, what they're doing. And so um, finding them is, you know, it's a little challenging in the sense, if you already have an Instagram account uh, started, you know, go look at the people who follow you. Obviously, they're interested yeah. in what your your state is doing, um, and then you know, dial it down with some with some hashtag you know searches. Right. Um, and then you know, once you kind of build a small group of people, you can start looking at who they're attached to, mm -hmm. uh, and and in that way, you can you can. And then I think that there was a question about the the you know long term. Right. You know, but so there's there's people we've worked with for a while, and we just kind of drifted apart. You know how relationships work sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we may not you know pick things up for a while, but then like something comes up in that community, and I'm like, hey, dust it off, and yeah, you know, yeah, how you doing? <laughs> right. Um, you know, so there there is. I think I think these things ebb and flow, and obviously I'm I'm out there looking for new people, but you know I, I was saying this yesterday. I, there's about ten people I have the capacity to kind of have this close relationship mm -hmm. with. Beyond that, it's, it's just too many people, you know. Agreed. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm extroverted in a sense, but 
I have a limit too. I, you know, oh, same. Too many yeah. relationships to manage, and so I, I tend to keep it a little smaller. Um, but I'm also looking for people, you know, diversity is a big one for us. Yes. Oregon is not a diverse state. Um, I'm really working to build diversity in our influencers because I want, to, I want people to be right. seen in that space, and that's, that's challenging. That's, that's become a, a really challenging uh, effort to try to, you know, there's just not a lot of people in that space, not, not a lot of diversity mm -hmm. in the state. Um, and so I've been reaching out to people. This is much more of like a, hey, do you know anybody in this mm -hmm. space? You know, and yeah. anybody who fly fishes, or anybody who, mm -hmm. you know, ocean fishes, you know, and so that's... And that's, maybe those influencers will have smaller followers, but again, both of you guys can grow, and then I guess, I'm guessing their followers are probably a lot more engaged because they are incredibly true and authentic, exactly. so... Um, I know we're Kendra? out of time. Kendra? Yes. Do we have one more question over here. Hello? Oh, we have one more question over here. <laughs> Hi, thank you. My name's Molly. I work for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Um, just thinking about our state and who we would probably be looking at um, is a lot of our fishing guides. People are looking at their content. And so my one question is, how do you keep your, you know, your support of an influencer and your use of an influencer from looking like a, a promotion for their business? And has your agency had issue with other maybe less trustworthy businesses going, hey, you're promoting this person through your, um, through your relationship. And then my second question is then, how do you measure your return on investment from working with an influencer? So the so I in Oregon we don't we don't we try not to use guides. Um, you know, just guides are they have a different relationship with mm -hmm. the agency. We we work closely with a lot of guides. You know, we do use guides for some things. Like I said before, we had a guide who worked with us on live streaming specifically. Um, but for the social media world, I don't, I don't rely on a lot of guides for that. Um, we did have, we do have one of our influencers who, uh, her husband's a guide, and she asked me, she straight up said, hey, is this going to be a conflict of interest? You know, and I said, I mean, if you're not, she goes, I sometimes guide for him. She'll fill in for him on certain days. And, but she's a biologist, and so I was like, well, that kind of outweighs that. And so I... I was okay with that, but generally we don't we don't use a lot of guides in that space. Um, we use them in you know relationship wise. We use them in other spaces. Um, yeah. And then for measuring ROI or measuring success of influencers too, I will say part of the sophistication that I mentioned with the industry is now that they can see all of the analytics on how their content performs. Or if you're using them as a spokesperson, maybe there's a certain amount of media interviews or something that you're using to set them up with. Um, with influencers, the biggest thing that we measure is awareness, um, which usually translates into impressions, reach, or engagements, things like that. Um, and those are all things that they should be able to report back to you through their channels. Yeah, and I was gonna say ROI might be a little bit different too if you're utilizing them for different yes. things. So if you're utilizing them um, to drive attendance at an event or to drive like conversions to a landing, like there's so many different ways to measure it. It would kind of depend on how you're leveraging those influencers. Yeah, that's good. Um, but like maybe you have a hashtag that you're just assigning all of your influencers to use when they're posting about you. You can measure it by that. So. There's different ways, just whatever your goals are for that specific campaign. I look at the comments after we, mm -hmm. you know, push messaging out through to see how our, our you know, because that, that's really the grasp of how, or that's, that's the sort of gist of the grasp, you know, of the con, uh, concept. And, and uh, so, so how they respond in the comments often reflects mm -hmm. how well I did at yeah. giving them the message and then yeah. how they related it. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of a, a big one for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm.